welcome back. I'm here with the maintenance supervisor at FMX Four Benning, and we have some of my favorite content. We're gonna show off two of the M88s they have here as part of their work and what they do maintaining the motor pool here for the U.S. Army. So I'm gonna turn the camera over to the soup, and he's gonna walk you through not only this vehicle but a little bit of his experiences and his service and some of the details about it that y'all might not know. Let's check it out. Okay, welcome. Your recovery vehicle, your M88A1, your M88A2 recovery vehicle, the primary mission for this vehicle is to recover vehicles that have either broken down or they have uh, managed to get themselves stuck on a maneuver, either in a hole, uh, up to the tank turn, they've sank in mud, they can't get out on their own power. So they designed this vehicle to be able to go and retrieve it, and even in a combat environment, to go in, extract a broke down vehicle, and get it back to a safe place where maintenance can be performed on it. So it's a, it's a very underrated vehicle, um, but it does more work than most of the vehicles in the Army fleet. And it does here every day. It, it's used for training young soldiers on how to recover, and it's used here to also recover vehicles that we still train on today in the Army. And it's a vehicle that gets used daily. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that this vehicle, it goes. We probably have two or three missions here a day just leaving this shop, going to recover vehicles to bring them back to this shop. So it's like the Army's tow truck for its combat and uh, non-combat fleet. And without it, I'm telling you, you'd be lost. There would be no way to haul any of this heavy stuff around. And uh, this is the workhorse. I mean, bottom line, it's a workhorse. It's just like a dozer for the engineers. This is a dozer for the maintenance field, for the ordnance store. So, yep. I'd like to show you a couple of our recovery vehicles that we work on here every day and use daily uh, to recover the uh, platform of M1A1, M1A2 V2s, and the new V3 SEPs. Uh, we've got the M88A1 here, which is one of the original configuration uh, recovery vehicles that the Army introduced back prior to uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, it's one of the older platforms of our recovery vehicles. Uh, it's uh, 56 tons. It is a uh, classic. Uh, I'll tell you folks, it's a classic. Uh, I spent seven years on one of these when I first came in the Army. Absolutely loved the uh, recovery. I uh, got to see a lot of the countryside in Europe doing recovery, pulling tanks out of snow banks ditches, overturned, stuck between trees, you name it, I've seen it. Uh, we can walk around this vehicle and I'll show you the differences on the outside and then we'll go over to the uh, A2 and look at the different configurations there. Uh, this is one of the older type models and basically the brake system, it's got uh, 1790 2DR um, engine and I'll show you that right here. We've got one sitting on the floor. This is the configuration of the Continental uh, diesel, 800 horsepower. It's, uh, it's a workhorse, to say the least. It pulls uh, the original A1, the 60 ton. Now we're pulling the uh, B2s now, and uh, it can't pull a V3 yet because the weight ratio, 56 tons versus 79 tons. So that's, that's a no-go when it starts here. Uh, we primarily do all the maintenance operations and services on this vehicle here. Uh, we have six in the fleet that we support. Um, the platform maintaining an A1 is, uh, you know, versus the A2, it's a lot easier to work on. I mean, the hydraulics in this one compared to the A2 is, is nothing. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's like a Volkswagen to a Cadillac. So on the outside of this one, you see kind of like how primitive it is, 40 age. Uh, a lot of these have been refurbished back in the 70s, early 80s, uh, and they're still maintaining in our Army fleet today. How many do you all have here of the A1s? We've got six total A1s here now um, that support the, uh, the MCOE and the training school. We've got uh, the six that support the GMD, which is a recovery course. So they still train the A1s in the recovery course. Uh, the winch system, is completely different from the A2. It won't pull as much, but you still have to instruct it because the Army still has it. 
So if you walk around the front of the vehicle, you'll notice the different configurations around the front. And you'll notice here that the main winch table is considerably smaller than the V2 that I'm going to show you. Um, it doesn't have the pull capacity as the main winch does on the V2. But like I said, we still have to train it and it still will recover a tank. You may need to have two, but they'll still do the job and they do it well. So as you can see, the configuration on the inside is also a little different. And you can tell it looks quite old. So now we'll turn around and we'll go here to the A2, the Hercules. This was introduced um, to upgrade with the M1s and the M1 E2 SEPs. Uh, they introduced the Hercules to be able to pull the weight of that particular vehicle. And it also will pull the V3. Now you notice what we talked about on the winch on the A1. Now you look at the winch on the A2. Considerable bit different on your Clevis assembly. They've added the ox winch, which the ox winch assists in paying out the main winch. The main winch is about three times heavier than that of the A1. So where you take the A1 on a recovery mission, you'd have your crew assisting you or your recovery crew on your 88 assisting you paying the winch out to the vehicle to recover. Unfortunately, this one, they introduced a heavier cable. So it would take 10 people to carry this versus four people to carry that. So they added an ox winch to assist to pay this main winch out to recover the other vehicle. That's where the added hydraulics come into function. When I was talking about the Volkswagen and the Cadillac, the hydraulics on the Hercules, 10 times heavier, 10 times more components, and uh, a lot more powerful when it comes time to pull and lift. This vehicle can do it. Uh, the main pumps on the Hercules versus one pump on the A1 You've got the three separate pumps. You've got a pump in there for your main winch assembly. You've got a pump for your boom assembly. And then you've got a pump for your um, hydraulic assembly, voice winch, and your main system. So you've got three hydraulic pumps and you've got a mechanical clutch that aid in the lifting, operation of spade, ox, boom, voice winch. You can see some of the really big differences in armor um, yes. between the two vehicles as well. It has added armor here on the front plate. Right here you can see the thickness on the front added armor. Here for the operator and the mechanic. And you've got added armor over your vision blocks. What you don't have on your A1. Uh, if we walk around this side of the vehicle, you'll notice the difference on this side. Your extra armor extends above where your crew cabin sits. It's also a little thicker in here. And you notice by the doors, the thickness here and the thickness of your doors. These doors are about an inch and a half thick, where the ones on your A1 are only about a quarter of an inch thick. So they've added the extra armor in there for light weapons or you know, light rockets that may fire against this vehicle. They've also added the side skirts. All these side skirts right here are all added. You see the thickness. This is also for any small arms fire or light anti-tank rockets, like your RPGs. And it covers a whole area down here on the skirts where the crew would be inside the crew compartment cavity. Here we've got one that's open, so you'll notice your skirts on the backs, how low they sit. All that area that these protect is all vital area of the hull. If you notice on the boom, the boom differences where the A1 boom is rounded, this boom has been squared off. That allows for the lift capacity of this boom. You've got a 140 ton snatch block on here. Um, this lift capacity can actually lift tank turrets off with it. 
and, and they have before um, in the desert pulled tank turrets which is about 22 tons that boom will pull that tank turret. Uh, your snatch block when I talked about your 140 ton snatch blocks up here on the boom the item up there with the hook on it is called a snatch block. And what that does is you route cables over pulleys, mechanical advantage, to use that block to lift certain weights. And that's where you get your advantage to be able to lift a 22-ton tank turret from your snatch block. Um, you have snatch blocks on the side, mounted over here for the main winch. Right here, this is your 140 ton snatch block. Now this aids in recovering. Say we have a tank that's mired up to the turret depth level. So we use the main winch, we can use the 140 ton snatch block. We lead out to that tank, wrap it around here, bring it back to this 88. We can do two to one, three to one, and this aids mechanical advantage on withdrawing the tank from the marred state. So for like crew access and ease of use, what are some big changes between the A1 and the A2? The big changes from the A1 to the A2, uh, your crew compartment is basically configured the same. Uh, your mechanic, driver mechanic seats are in the same location, TC seats in the same location. They have removed the rigger seat, so now you only have a crew of three, which in the A1 you still have the rigger seat, which sits right back here in the middle. So they did that so they could aid in um, a lift area to where they can work on this vehicle and they can remove your hydraulic pumps if necessary. Um, you can remove your mechanical clutch if necessary. Uh, you don't really need a rig because the other individuals on that vehicle know how to do rigging. So there's no separate rigger per se anymore. A1s used to have a crew of four, now the A2 has a crew of three carry your driver, you carry your mechanic, and you've got your TC, generally an NCO. Um, it allows for another soldier to be put on another vehicle, so you have the crews of threes. So you're not really using a whole uh, half a squad to operate one vehicle. Um, your rigger primarily, everybody's trained in rigging, so your rigger primarily was just an extra hand. So you really didn't, that function wasn't necessary. The uh, A1, uh, this is the engine on the A1. It's a 1790 2DR Continental Diesel, twin turbos, uh, about 800 horsepower. You've got uh, designed to pull light and medium duty uh, armor equipment, uh, Bradley fighting vehicles, 113s, primarily what was the 578s, uh, your basic M1, your M60s. It's, it's a typical engine of an M60, just a little dip configured differently um, on your A2s, same engine concept, Continentals. Uh, it's a thousand horsepower. The turbos have been upgraded on it. Uh, you had uh, added hydraulic oil coolers because of the massive hydraulic system modifications that the A2 has incorporated. Now you have to have oil coolers to help cool down the hydraulic oil so that the system doesn't overheat and you may lose hydraulics uh, lifting something or pulling something or towing something so they had to add the oil coolers if you notice the a1 configuration it does not have those oil coolers mounted on the vehicle the basic consistent configuration is both for well, heavier equipment um, like your v2s you have your your heavier set tanks and that's the reason the design came out this is uh, one of the engines here that we've been working on in the shop if you notice, uh, here's the turbos. The turbos are exposed. This was uh, like a training model. You've got your flywheel back here. Then up here are your fan drives. This cools the engine. Uh, it actually draws the air up through your coolers, and up through the top, and then vents it out the back. That's how this engine is cooled. It's air cooled. So it's not water cooled like the typical automotive engine. It is air cooled, okay? And you have engine oil coolers and transmission oil coolers mounted on the outside. So it keeps the transmission oil cool and the engine oil cool while it's in operation. These items here are your exhausts, manifolds, that jet the exhaust out of your cylinders, it's a 12 cylinder engine, through your turbos, and then out the exhaust stacks. 
Any thoughts on moving back to water cooled for the V3? Um, there has been some thought about water cooled engines. Um, the configuration with the, the, the 12 cylinder, it's been in the Army for so long, it's worked. Uh, I know everybody wants change and they want to go, you know, different things. I don't know if the water cooled route is necessarily going to be better or if it's going to cost more maintenance time to try to repair that vehicle. Um, there's going to have to be a lot of different configurations on where you're going to put a water cooler. I know most of your Army equipment, you know, your Bradley still runs water, uh, your Strikers still run water, uh, MRAPs are water, your 88s and your tanks. Those are all air, so the concept is there. You know, there could be a possibility down the road that they may decide to go ahead to a water-cooled diesel. And if, in fact, the Continental's been around a long time, you know, it's a proven engine, so we'll see what they decide. Uh, like I said, when we started um, the story, I was on these uh, about seven years when I first came in the Army, uh, and it wasn't until uh, I did a tour in Europe that I really found out uh, how this vehicle operated, um, the ins and outs of it, because the terrain over there is a little different. And this just happened to occur one winter when we were out on maneuvers. I was in Hollinsfels. We were uh, out and I was stationed, you know, recover vehicles. They stationed themselves in certain locations, uh, let the other combat equipment do their business, and they didn't until they call us. Well. This particular day, I got a call for a recovery mission. One of our vehicles was stuck. Okay, typical mission, I'm thinking to myself, no problem. There's myself and my, my uh, TC, which is uh, another E5. And uh, so, ah, this should be simple. So we take off, we're going down the tank trail. Mind you now, it's snowing, so it's a little slick. And it's probably, I don't know, maybe two or three kilometers away from where we are. We get on site to do this recovery, and lo and behold, the vehicle in question was stuck in between a tree. Two trees, mind you, and it was off the ground. So, the tracks were up, and they were probably three feet off the ground. The vehicle stuck in between two trees, and uh, the two trees aren't given up. So they're gonna hold this vehicle there until somebody gets it out. So I roll up on it, and lo and behold, it's one of the members of my uh, unit. And, uh, you know, an old saying back then, if we have to come and recover you, then you're going to have to pay us in gratuity, something that we want. And, you know, back then it was, uh, okay, a bottle of liquor. You owe us. When we get back, and a bratwurst. So we get this tank, hook up to him. We start to pull him out from the two trees, and the two trees aren't giving up. They are not giving up. So we back up a little farther, we hook up three to one, and this old girl here managed to yank that tank out of those two trees. And uh, it had a slight drop when it hit the ground after we recovered it, got it pulled back, checked everything out. Nothing was damaged on the vehicle. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, that crew had to pay up after we got back to Garrison. And uh, it was well deserved because we spent 45 days out there, and it was uh, pretty cold during that time frame in the winter time. That's just one of many stories on this vehicle right here that uh, that I remember, and uh, had a lot of good times operating this thing. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything you couldn't recover? No. <laughs> no. Every mission that we went out on uh, on a recovery mission, we may have had to have two 88s but there wasn't anything that we could not physically get out that we had to you know, depend on somebody else to get. Um, generally, I tried to recover one-to-one. -one. Um, a lot of times we had to use two-to-one because a lot of the folks in the units were driving places where you wouldn't even walk through. So uh, they'd get stuck in there, marred up depth level and turret depth level. And then there was a, a mission that we went on uh, one morning uh, with one of these A1s, uh, and that was back in Fort Riley, Kansas, where uh, the unit was rolling out mid-morning. We were again in the location, and uh, 
get a call on the radio, we've got a tank flipped over upside down in the creek. So we get on site, and sure enough, the tank was upside down in the creek. The crew was in the vehicle. So we kind of had to uh, hurry along there, get this prepped for recovery, got it into recovery mode, uh, raised the tank up on its side, got the crew out, collected all the necessary weapons, and then brought the tank over on its track. And uh, about uh, six hours later, we had the tank recovered out of the ditch using 188 up the side of the bank and sitting on the uh, sitting on the platform. Cool, cool. Do you have one last story? Okay. Um, yeah. In Hornsfels, uh, back same mission. Uh, Homesville, Germany. Uh, again, it's snowing. Tank trails are covered with snow. I had to go recover a, uh, a, a unit vehicle that was uh, broke down on the side of the tank trail, take it back to the uh, UMCP for maintenance repair. Um, we hooked up to that particular vehicle, started to tow back, and about halfway back, we started sliding on the tank trail. And unfortunately, on the tank trail with snow, I'm hooked up to a tank it's trying to pull me down the other way. So in order to get that vehicle back, then I had to come up with an adaptive way to be able to wiggle my way back. Um, so what I did was I moved to the side of the tank trail and I just daisy chained back and forth, left, right, left, right, left, right, zigzagged all the way back uh, in the dry powder snow to get this vehicle back to the UMCP. And about four hours later, we made it back, so the crew got back safe, the vehicle got recovered safe, and I got back. And uh, after that particular mission, we got back to the unit, and uh, I did receive an award for that recovery operation. Wow. Real cool. Thank you so much for watching. First and foremost, I would like to thank the soup and the crew out there for the awesome filming opportunity. These vehicles are some of my absolute favorites and I love them. I hope you love them too and that you learned a lot. They play a very, very crucial role and I think are very often overlooked. The tank gets a lot of attention and love on the silver screen and in modern video games and is a legend on the battlefield in its own right. However, it would be stuck in the mud or broken back at home without one of these beasts to help out. They are the backbone of keeping our armor moving and I am very, very thankful to be able to have filmed a closer look at them for you guys. If you dug it, stay tuned. We have some more videos on the M88 Hercules and its operation, as well as some more armored adventures coming up soon. Toss a subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I will see you next time.